things back underway here. And Gray. Is it quickly taken by Furlong? But the referee doesn't like the look of that. Dyma'r herd yn credu oedd Robin yn cymeriau ato yn ystod i gyfraniad e. Cwm eisiau cadw safon Adron Dwob. Adron yn glir a tifasu ddem a Scott Baldwin. A Scott Baldwin yn tynnu. And welcome back to the Canadian Ruck. This is Jamie Gray. And as you might have guessed it, this week we have uh, Team Canada captain, Chief Second Row of Chiefs of the Super Rugby, Tyler Ardron. Tyler's great little conversation. And uh, we'll get to him in a little bit. As always, you can contact us on Twitter at Canadian Ruck, Instagram, the underscore Canadian underscore Ruck, Facebook, at the Canadian Ruck, email the Canadian Ruck at gmail.com. Make sure you watch, listen, but also follow and subscribe YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Google Podcasts, and Castbox. So, variety of ways to uh, hear the pod, uh, listen to some great Canadian rugby players and rugby talk. As I mentioned uh, earlier, our hats are on order. Uh, you can order some. Uh, there's also uh, a chance to win them for free if you ask some questions on social media via email. We've already got two people, three people, I think, that have already claimed some. Uh, get them quick. Uh, there's only been 10 ordered, and three are already on the way out the door. So in current news, uh, as everybody knows, COVID-19 still kind of wreaking havoc. Uh, it's hitting the U.S. quite hard. Canada seems to be doing, I mean, it's not great here for sure, uh, but we seem to be uh, taking some pretty good precautions. Uh, tagline is, uh, we'll, we'll conquer this together. I always find that a little um, funny or ironic maybe because the way that uh, we're supposed to beat this is kind of being alone. Um, so alone, we can beat this when we work together individually. And it's, it's hitting more rugby news. As everybody knows, everything's canceled. Um, French Barbarians were supposed to tour in Montreal uh, against Canada in July. Uh, Rugby Canada and French Barbarians just canceled that as of uh, a couple days ago. Uh, but the Canada-Italy match on for July 11th uh, in Halifax, that's still on the docket. So hopefully things turn around and that game can be played. Uh, it's really exciting when uh, the Atlantic Coast, uh, East Coast gets to host a national game. I was fortunate to watch Canada in U.S. a couple of years ago. It was a great atmosphere. So hopefully that one gets played. Hopefully everything's kind of back to normal where we can go and enjoy that, that massive international. Uh, but a week ago, some Crusaders players down in uh, New Zealand uh, of Super Rugby were caught training. Uh, Tyler and I talk a little bit about that. It sounds like it was accidental. Hopefully it was. Um, if you haven't read up on that or seen any of the footage, but uh, there's about five of them that were caught on a training ground. Uh, they all pleaded that it was uh, accidental where they all just kind of wandered out of, the, out of their different apartment buildings and and uh, ended up on the same field. They all admitted that they were passing the ball around and they shouldn't have. They apologized, but it uh, it got picked up pretty quick by the New Zealand media. It'd be the same as if something happened in Canada or the States where, you know, <clears throat> LeBron ends up going to a basketball court and shooting some hoops and a bunch of Lakers players show up or, you know, if Crosby, you know, he's out pond, skating on the pond and a few other guys show up. So it just, it was pretty widespread there. And uh, this is interesting. This just kind of came out recently. The Major League Rugby, the MLR is going to host a draft uh, on June 13th and June 14th, but it's only, uh, they're only looking at U.S. universities. Um, main reason is that there are visa issues um, in Canada for for the uh, university players to try and get working visas to go to the States. <clears throat> because of this, the Arrows aren't taking part in the inaugural season. Uh, but don't fret because uh, Canada's, you know, reintroduced the Pacific Pride last year with Jamie Cudmore coaching. And the Arrows are, they have the Arrows Academy going um, with quite a few players. One, you know, one New Brunswick boy, Will Hand, is there. So, um, maybe uh, eventually Canada will be able to take part in uh, Canadian universities will be able to take part in the draft, but it, uh, it, it just needs to get worked out so that those players could travel to the States and play. So our lead in today, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because Tyler, you're going to, you all want to listen to Tyler for sure. But personally, it's been, uh, it's been real lucky for me. Uh, I've been, uh, you know, s stranded at home like most of you during COVID-19 and uh, I'm a teacher uh, and I work at an independent school and we're still doing online learning. Um, but 
having the chance to talk with these rugby greats, um, you know, Al Sharon, Heather Moyes, Maria Sampson. Uh, I chatted with Gareth Reese a couple days ago, Cole Keith, Chauncey O'Toole, Jeff Sinclair, uh, DTH Vandermeerway. I chatted with him as well, uh, James Pritchard and, and Tyler, who's on today. Um, it's been awfully humbling for me to get a, a chance to speak to some of these greats, but it's also, um, it's also helped me personally get through some of these tough days with COVID-19 and lockdowns. And I hope it's also given you a, you all a chance to give yourself a break uh, and, and just listen to some good stories. Um, some great rugby stories uh, from some very humble, humble superstar athletes. And I think when I speak to all these people, these, these are some of the terms that come across my mind, how humble they are, but also how willing and engaging they are. Uh, I haven't, been denied anybody anybody i've asked so far i've been all say yeah i'd love to tell my story uh i'd love to chat rugby and you know listen let some canadian members of the uh canadian uh public listen and, and hear some thoughts i have about the game and i think that is really admirable for these athletes to be willing to do this especially these people that are at the top of their game or you know are enshrined in in world, you know, world hall of fames, et cetera. And it's just great. It, it, they love sharing stories and having some laughs. And I'm lucky enough to be along the ride with, with all of this. Uh, each member that I speak to, they, uh, they often recommend others to chat with, you know, the, you know, speak with so-and-so they've got some great stories or talk to so-and-so and watch, you know, how they, they, as they were going through the national program, they also put themselves through university and they're now, you know, an engineer or whatnot. And it's, uh, it's great to see that. Uh, each player and each uh, retired player, each person I've spoken with uh, has given a real, that real true rugby spirit uh, and they've all displayed character and camaraderie and it's, it's been amazing. And they all, they all talk about, you know, using this downtime um, to kind of reflect on their life. And I, I think uh, as I talk to them, they, they all say the same thing that this is, this podcast has given them a chance. And when we get to Gareth Reese's, uh, he, he kind of mentions that a couple of times when we have him on in a couple of, a couple of other pods. Uh, it's really, really interesting to hear that. So I urge all of you, um, take this time, this downtime and reconnect with some of your old rugby buddies. Uh, I know, you know, social distancing and physical distancing is a, is a huge thing right now, but make use of some video calling you know, get on, get on Zoom, get on Facebook Messenger, get on, uh, you know, whatever, FaceTime and, and just chat with some of these old guys and share a beer virtually with uh, your old teammates, you know, guys or girls or whoever, and, uh, you know, get in touch. And uh, I think this is a great time. Life is slowing down right now. Uh, and it's a great time to reconnect with some of these, uh, some of your old teammates. So I encourage all of you to do that. And that's, that's leading us right into our special guest. Uh, lucky enough to have Tyler Ardron on. Uh, he's chatting with me. He's down in New Zealand right now. And uh, he's living uh, with some family, friends during, during their uh, quarantine. Uh, and it sounds like it's a rough time. There's a, he said something along the lines of they're allowed out every like three or four days for essentials. And it's, uh, it can be tricky, but it seems like he's, uh, he's weathering the storm quite well. Tyler captained uh, Canada the 2015 and 2019 Rugby World Cups. And he walks you through that process. Uh, you know, he, the captaincy was kind of taken from him for a little bit and then given back. And he shows great perseverance in his play for that. He's, he's you know, represented Canada 37 times where he plays eight man. Uh, and currently he's playing for the Chiefs uh, in the Sands are over in Super Rugby there. Uh, we play second row and currently the Chiefs are second, I believe, in the New Zealand division. And I think fifth overall uh, when the quarantine and the, and the lockdown and everything happened. Uh, they're having a fantastic season. Played for uh, Bay of Plenty in the minor 10. He also played for the Ospreys in Pro 14 in Wales, and he had some really good seasons there. So as we talk to Tyler, he kind of walks you through uh, those different programs and how we get to be playing for the Chiefs and what my opinion is the greatest, uh, the greatest rugby league in the world, uh, Super Rugby. And uh, he's a really dynamic player for that team and he's he's played with some great players he's played with Brody Retallick he plays with Damian McKenzie and Anton Leonard Brown and he's uh he, he gets to bring some of that that stuff back when he plays for Canada but he talks more about bringing character and philosophy as much as uh, skills and things like that so it's it's a great conversation with Tyler I hope you enjoy it uh, I definitely had a, a a lot of pleasure listening listening to his story all right, so welcome back. We're on the line with Tyler Ardron. Tyler's uh, he's in uh, Waikato right now in New Zealand, 
and he's on hiatus with Chiefs of Super Rugby due to COVID-19. And uh, he's been uh, nice enough and gracious enough to grant us some time uh, for our podcast. So, Tyler, welcome. Uh, it's, it's great having you here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me on. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about Canadian rugby, a little bit about your Chiefs and a few other things. Let, let's start with, uh, with Canada and, and the past two World Cups, 2015 and 2019. You were captain for both of those events. What, uh, what can you tell us about your experience as the captain, as the leader of the team? Yeah, the 20, 20 well, yeah, they were definitely vastly different. I mean, <clears throat> completely different staff, coaching staff, um, rankings in the world. Uh, it probably couldn't have been much different of an experience between the two, but, <clears throat> uh, or maybe right at the beginning of 2015 that I was named the captain of the team then, and I took over from Carpenter, and <clears throat> we'd work kind of side by side for a little while, kind of making the transition, and uh, I think knowing, well, we all knew that, come the 2015 World Cup that I would be the captain by then but when was the right time to do it and and how everything would would play out in the meantime was a bit up in the air so yeah that one I was really caught up in that um, just trying to figure out what I needed to do as a captain and probably worrying a bit about being a captain whereas uh, I think now I I know how I live my life and how I play rugby and, and who I am as a person a little bit better and uh, if I fit the mold of a captain, then I fit the mold of a captain for that team. And if I don't, then, then I don't. And I think that's a better way to, to go about it than trying to, to really be something that you think the team needs. So, right. uh, yeah, it was a bit different. But also, I mean, it was amazing having uh, – we we went into that thinking we had a real chance at qualifying for that next one. I mean, we I can't believe we didn't beat Italy. We were that close. Um, but also, I was kept battling through some injuries as well, so – I didn't get to play the Ireland game. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have been the one to tip us to win that game. So <laughs> that one went the way it was going to go. Um, the Italy game went down to the end and it was like one of the most heartbreaking losses I've ever had uh, in a Canadian jersey. Yeah, but I mean, a, we were proud. We were very proud of that game. It was, yeah, it was a good game. Uh, it would have been a tough one for sure. Yeah. So, I, but I mean, I, yeah, I'd rather I'd rather come off the field playing like that and uh, and losing than than going out and, and playing a team we can easily beat and not playing well. So there's a, a lot of satisfaction in how we played coming off, uh, and then playing France, which is where I ended up getting injured. But I mean, we we were we were very good against France as well. We had some momentum rolling after the Italy game, and yeah, uh, yeah we <clears throat> yeah I would have loved to stay on for that whole game and. Uh, see what see what could have come of it because um, yeah obviously even in the end it wasn't uh, it wasn't too much of a blowout uh, and then unfortunately couldn't make the the Romania game but that was probably one of the tougher moments it's it's always hard watching watching the boys lose a game when you can't do anything to help so that was um, yeah that was but it was it was an enjoyable really enjoyable experience being at that World Cup because yeah. not only did we believe you can naively believe and have no shot but. Uh, we believed we could win two of those games, and we like we proved we could have if, if a ball bounced another way. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that one was awesome. It's obviously been um, the last four years have been a bit more, bit more of uh, a tough time probably for me with Canadian rugby. I, I we had Mark Anscom come in, and I it was never given any reason, but I was just set to the side. I, I think I was in the leadership group at the time, but definitely not captain um didn't have any input in the team so I went from being the captain and uh working really closely with all the management and staff and then just being you know like not really asked to do anything to be honest I was just brought along and hadn't really been given a role uh but he didn't he didn't end up lasting very long and uh yeah sorry I just gonna say that's hard unfair all the work you put in and then just kind of cast aside without any conversation or reasoning there that's that's difficult yeah yeah so I don't I didn't really know how to take that one but, but I mean I was obviously like having my professional rugby I was at the Ospreys at the time and uh, and just moving to to New Zealand I mean I've, I have both sides to go back to so um it, yeah it hurt a bit just not really knowing and kind of just going with the flow I guess and not really something I'm normally uh, not a position I'm normally put in but uh yeah it didn't end up lasting too long and uh, obviously Kingsley came in and uh, for the first like two years I think I was I was in a bit of a bit of a leadership role helping out Phil Mack and DTH were captaining quite a bit and I was 
I was in and around just playing and um, I ended up like stepping aside completely, um, just playing rugby and out of the leadership group, out of any decision making. Uh, yeah, I wasn't involved in lineouts. I was just there when called to play rugby. And so it really took, it was, yeah, like it went up and to the 2015 World Cup and I probably took quite a, a back step and was really set to the side in terms of anything outside of my rugby ability. Anything I had to offer leadership wise was um, just put on hold. And then I guess it wasn't until, yeah, it wasn't actually until the lead up to the World Cup, even the repertoire all that, I wasn't in, involved in anything leadership wise. So it was most of four years. And then Kingsley came back and asked me if I'd captain at the World Cup, which was a bit of a shock to me, to be honest, after being set aside for that long. I've been, I've been yeah. focusing a lot on uh, one of the bigger members of the leadership group here at the Chiefs. And uh, that was something I was really passionate about. And, and I kind of hummed and hawed a bit for, um, but I think, yeah, I think it was probably for the best for the team. And that's what made me end up doing it. So yeah, as you can probably tell from, from that long winded answer, there were very, very <laughs> different circumstances that got me to captain one World Cup to the other. No, I think that's fair. That's a really, um, Really good answer, really good uh, discussion for both of those. Um, you went from that high to a disappointment and a letdown with the coaching changes. And then, you know, you worked your way, you, you, you put your head down and you grinded it out. And, you know, Jones recognized that and, and, and let you take that C back over. And I think, I, I think that shows true, uh, true character on your part and what rugby's all about. You know, you, you might get some bad breaks, but you gotta persevere and keep going. So. Well done. That's uh, that's that's a nice little story for sure. What? Um, yeah, I think it probably helped as well as a as a rugby player. I think like I was, I've never maybe in my first couple of years, but it's it's hard to play my best rugby. I've always struggled to play my best rugby for Canada, just because the game's a very different game to what what I play overseas. So I think yeah, um, yeah I really I had one simple thing to focus on, and that was just to play rugby. And I mean, we we managed to qualify that repertoire, so it, it worked out for the best. Yeah, that was fun to watch for sure. Um, as, as a captain, are you a quiet leader? You sound like you're pretty, uh, you're a pretty uh, emotional guy in the sense that you're you're pretty laid back. Yet you seem like you're you're ready to kind of go and do things. How do you lead your team? What do you do to inspire your team? I think yeah, I definitely know what's, uh, I'm definitely not. I'm definitely a loud leader. I don't give any pump up speeches. Uh, it's not really. It doesn't come natural to me, and I just want to be myself as a as a rugby player and as a leader. So. I would say I'm more a behind the scenes kind of guy. Like uh, the standards that I live by, I, I really like to, to set a good example, I think, and I do my best that way. And I'm definitely not shy to pull somebody aside and, uh, and have a word with them if I don't think that, uh, that they're living up to the standards we expect as a team. So I, I like to think that that's kind of where, uh, where my strength is as a leader. I like to think that I can uh, not necessarily unite 40, 50 guys to, to all like me, but um, that I can unite 40, 50 guys to get on the same page towards that one, one or two goals we have uh, as a team and, and drive everybody in the right direction and then uh, just go out every weekend and, and I play my hardest. And I, th I think that's where, uh, where the most respect come from is just uh, I'm, willing to, I'm willing to do whatever I can on, on Saturday when we play and, and I think the guys see that. So. We're, yeah, really leading by example and making sure everybody's hopefully on the same page, uh, striving for the same thing. That's great. That's perfect. So, little switch. You're playing. You're playing for the Chiefs uh, in Super Rugby. You've had some great names, uh, great New Zealand names that you've played with and with still: Sam Kane, Aaron Cruden, Brad Weber, Damian McKenzie, Anton Leonard Brown, Brody Retallick, Nathan Harris, a bunch of other guys. A lot of those guys played key roles for the All Blacks. Uh, how does preparing with and playing with those guys, I know Retallick's not there now, but playing and preparing with those guys, how does that help you prepare? Um, yeah, I mean, once you're on a team with them and you, everybody's got their part to play, like, like I said, I'm, I'm one of the, probably the bigger voices in the team now. And uh, I, I really run a lot of things, especially line out wise. Uh, I have, I have a lot of input into things on defense as well. So it's, uh, I don't think so much about, I, I just respect them as rugby players. And it's amazing to be able to, um, to have such an input into, especially like our defensive lineup is really my baby. Like uh, I come with my plan, 
I bring it to the coach to make sure that there's nothing crazy he hasn't he hasn't seen or that we were on the same page and then I transfer that into a game and defense I'm definitely one of the biggest drivers of how we're going to defend a team and uh, different ways and, and just knowing that I have those guys there uh, I can tr you can you can plan things that you wouldn't be able to plan in most teams because you've just got the skill and uh, the speed of decision like you tell somebody if if this happens look for this sort of thing and like yeah one little conversation you have over a coffee on Tuesday you'll on Saturday they'll get it 100% of the time and uh, that, that's the kind of thing that just makes it so amazing having those guys and and they've all got their pieces of the puzzle as well that they put in and um, equally I, I like to think that I can I can do the same like they'll it's all it's all little conversations you have it's all such small margins at this level and uh, we all get along really well. So just having, I mean, Sam and I go out hunting all the time. We'll just, on the way back after a red deer hunt, we'll have a chat about what we might do on a scrum play here or something like that. And yeah. it comes together on, on the weekend. So, uh, yeah, it's just having the, the guys with that ability and that knowledge around that makes everything really flow nicely. That's awesome. So what can you, I guess, what are you learning from these guys that you can bring back to rugby Canada? I mean, it sounds like you're sharing knowledge back and forth, like it's a give and take. It's not just you learning, but you're also helping uh, helping some of these guys as well. What what are you able to bring back to Canada, even though it's a different style of play with Canada than it is for the Chiefs and how it's played in you know in the Southern Hemisphere? What can what can you bring back? Yeah, it's it's an interesting one because I think the main thing I can bring back is uh, the team team dynamics, how to build a good culture, uh, all those those big rocks that we need. Uh, which is which is difficult because I'm in a stage of my career where, where I'm really focusing on the little minute details of each thing, trying to just improve a couple percent in this area. And uh, like I was talking to Graham Moffat the other day on uh, on a call, and he was talking about what kind of things I do personally. And I mean, I've, I've got this tackle technique that I've been working on. It's probably been two years now, and I felt like I've probably stepped back in my physicality and up in my tackle percentage. And I don't see myself getting to the physicality and tackle percentage I want probably for another year at least of working on this or more. And um, that's just the level that I'm at right now, really trying to not perfect because nothing will be perfect in a, in a game with so much decision making, but to really just try to improve little skills. But that being said, bringing that back to Rugby Canada uh, isn't going to help things in a bigger picture. So uh, I really have to pull myself away from the, the small details of a, of a game that we work on day in day out here and kind of come back to what's an overall philosophy of rugby what what do we need uh what what do I need to do as a, as a team member to be valuable and what can I help um I mean anywhere from management to young players to senior players in, in terms of my uh knowledge and experience and uh yeah it's, it's definitely a totally different uh aspect of the game and of the culture that I I think that is helpful for rugby Canada compared to what I normally work on day to day here. Right. Yeah. The, the culture, the two, the culture between New Zealand and Canada naturally are quite different, but uh, I follow the all blacks religiously and read all the literature that they produce. Um, so I think from a fan's point of view and somebody that really loves rugby Canada, whatever you can bring back, I think is, uh, is gravy for us back home. So, yeah. Yeah. So, before COVID-19 hit, Chiefs were having a pretty good season, sitting fifth overall. Um, you guys are, you were rolling really under the watch fly of Warren Gatlin. Um, Gats is one of the best coaches in the world, very respectful guy, uh, very knowledgeable. What is he doing? What is he doing to help you as a player? What's it like having Gats as a coach? Yeah, he's uh, he's a man manager. He, like, I mean, the, unfortunately, but, Frig, those two games we lost, I wasn't playing, uh, which, like I said, is worse sitting on the sideline watching. But, uh, yeah, he keeps a rotation. Last year, I played – I had to miss one game from a concussion, and otherwise I played 80 minutes every single game. And then you get to the quarterfinal, and you're not going to play your best rugby every week for a whole season, but I probably wasn't playing 90% of my best rugby. I was probably – around 80% of what I'm capable of because, I mean, you, your body can only handle so much. And, and that's where Gats has it right. Like, he's – everybody on our squad that has is fit and healthy has played a game and started a game, I believe, for the Chiefs now this season. And that's what's going to pay off in the end, not finishing first in the New Zealand Conference and uh, 
and making sure that we have the best regular season we've ever had. It's, it's about winning the league. And uh, I think in the long run, we were, I think we were the team to beat. I mean, the Sharks are obviously looking really good. Uh, uh, yeah, but as a, as a New Zealand team, I, I think we were the one that would be feared. So I think he's really got that right. And then yeah. personally, uh, it, there's just he, – he's, he doesn't talk a lot, and he's very, he's very small what, he, what he'll say, but he keeps you accountable. You make sure that you check in with the other coaches more than anything. And uh, He's got his little special parts of the game where he'll come and add his input. And, uh, yeah, just little minor things, really. That's pretty cool, though. Very good uh, – I guess a lot of experience there and trusting his coaching staff and trusting his players. That's, that's great yeah. to coach. So a little side note, uh, it was reported on the weekend that some of the Crusaders accidentally met up, trained together. Um, There's reports that came out and said that they all live kind of close together. It was an accident. What are your, what's your take on that? What do you, what do you think has, what do you, what do you think is going on there? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that as rugby players, we just kind of have to know better. Like you're a public figure, especially in New Zealand. It's the biggest sport there is. So it'd be like Sidney Crosby coming around and, hanging out with one of his mates down to the local rink kind of thing. So it's obviously not, not something you should do, but uh, it's a tough one as well. Like we want to train, we want to stay in shape. I know the New Zealand government sees rugby as something that can help the recovery here. And we'll, I'm sure we'll be playing behind closed doors. Uh, there won't be any fans, but uh, from what I hear, Sky Sports will probably go under if they can't get rugby back on soon here because it's that big to them in New Zealand and Australia. And uh yeah, I mean, so obviously there's both sides of it, but ah, probably throwing the rugby ball around is where where they made the mistake, not keeping their distance and and doing that. So yeah, I know uh, I know I'm trying to be careful, and like I was saying earlier, if uh, I'm going to try to get a run on our field soon, but obviously now having that come out in the media, if I see one of the other boys out there running, I'll just turn back and and try another time because it's just not worth having someone take a photo of it and, and blowing it up, even if it's not a big deal. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it, it, do, it does seem like it was just pure coincidence that they all ended up there together, but it just didn't look good, I guess, on the, in the media. Yeah, and I think they threw a rugby ball around, which is obviously something something you shouldn't be doing, passing right. anything around. Now we're in pretty big lockdown, so yeah, yeah. Is lockdown all over the country, or is it just in different regions? No, completely. I mean, some regions have taken it. I don't know how you can get more extreme than we're in right now. Like, I mean, I've... I leave the house every four days. Leave. We, I've got a bit of property, luckily, where we are here. But, uh, yeah, I leave every four days probably just to grab some groceries and we kind of have a rotation who goes out to do that. But, yeah, you're not allowed to – you can't drive somewhere and park to go for a walk. If you want to go for a walk and get fresh air, it's got to be from your front door and back to it. Um, you definitely can't meet up with anyone. You definitely have to keep your space. And, really, if you're driving around, the police have full right to pull you over and, and ask you what you're doing. And, yeah, if you, you'll be sent home pretty quick. Actually, a, a funny one is the uh, the health minister of New Zealand. Like, I'm sure he's getting slated enough as it is, but he got caught going out for a mountain bike ride the other day, and he's the one that put all these rules in place. The police pulled him over, and he had his bike in the back of the car. And obviously, you're taking your bike somewhere. It should you should be riding. Yeah, that's that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I don't know as how I long. Say not as I do. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So there's been talk over the last 48 hours over the potential Rugby Club World Cup. Um, initial thoughts, it would be 20 teams, top four from the French top 14, top four from the English Premiership, top four from Pro 14, top six from Super Rugby, and the champions from Japan and Major League Rugby. Uh, I know this is really new to, I think, almost anybody, but uh, they're, they're thinking it would be an annual event also, uh, except for during World Cup years. As a, as a player who plays for one of those top six spots in Super Rugby, would this be exciting? What would the players think? Is that something that you would all want to do and take part in? Or is it, would it be too, uh, make your seasons too condensed, too much rugby? What do you think there? Oh, I'd love it. I think it'd be awesome if we could have that. I definitely want to stay with the Chiefs if we're going to do that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, it's, it's a tough one because obviously the money in Super Rugby is not comparable to Japan or anywhere in Europe. And then, uh, yeah, you think even the, the English and um, the English league and the Pro 14 can't compete with Japan or France for money as well. So it's such it's so different that way. Uh, I don't know how exactly they would go about working it, but <clears throat> if they could balance it out, I mean, that would that'd be awesome for me. I could 
spend my whole career hopefully here playing in, in New Zealand, which I love. So I'd, I'd be pretty happy to see it happen. And I think it'd be great competition. I always wonder what it would be like to go and yeah. play those big teams. It'd be great for fans too. Is you know, I listen to podcasts from all over the world. And I, I listen to one called the Rugby Pod, and it's got a few uh, retired uh, gents from the English Premiership League. And they were they weren't a huge fan of it. Um, I, I guess I look at it like in Europe, it's a professional business. In New Zealand, it's professional business, but in New Zealand, you guys are also aided along by New Zealand rugby where you know training's kind of similar but in and you all have that same sense that if we work together as this it strengthens all the programs but in in Europe it's basically it's individual clubs against each other and there's no kind of community rugby tie-in to help each other out so I I think it would be really interesting my my preference is to watch super rugby um but uh they they were they were they were against it they thought it would uh deteriorate the premiership I think more than anything yeah I mean it probably would take away from each league individually but what you're building in in total is probably something bigger than anything we have so yeah I don't know there's I get it, it's it's such a tough business having different leagues running and different yeah. models and it's, it, it's confusing I, I got it when I read that article yesterday I was like oh this would be awesome <laughs> yeah oh yeah I'd love to go over and play the Saracens in London yeah Jeez. <laughs> how does it feel to be an important member of the Chiefs as a Canadian? Like you're you're an outsider. Person. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I thought more about being a Canadian the first year I came over. I think, and I forget that I. They always used to make fun of my accent in the first year, and uh, yeah, I get poked fun. I definitely had to earn a spot. There's no doubt about that. I didn't come in having uh, having the respect of anyone uh, here. But I, I don't even the past two years. I haven't even considered myself as. Uh, as being any different to anyone else now, it's, uh, I, I totally forget about it until it comes to international windows and I have to go back and I get to play for Canada and they get to play for New Zealand. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I'd, uh, I think it's the same with anything you put, you put your time in, you become a, a peer with, with all the people you're working with and yeah, it doesn't, doesn't make much difference now. That's awesome. Was there a transition? Like you left Canada, you went to the Ospreys in Wales uh, from there, you kind of went. I think you went to Bay of Plenty in, in the Mitre Ten. Yeah, from Bay of Plenty up with the Chiefs. What were the trans transitions like from those different areas? Like, obviously, Canada to Chiefs is vastly different rugby, but all those little steps along the way. What were some learning points for you? What were some differences? Well, the biggest learning curve would have been going from being a university student in Canada to the Ospreys. I mean, it was just day in, day out rugby as a, as a full-time professional and ended up putting in four years there. So that was really, that built the foundation for professional rugby for me from then on. And uh, after that, it was quite easy to move. Uh, I, I actually signed with the Chiefs uh, for two years, first of all, and then I ended up uh, deciding to things. So... Uh, I knew I was coming over to play Super Rugby, and then I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll do that as well. And Mount Monganui, where Bay of Plenty is based, is just such a beautiful part of the world. So <laughs> I was really fortunate to get to go there. And uh, it's it's kind of relaxed. I mean, it's 10 weeks, or was it nine-week season? You play 10 games. Uh, it's a lot of fun. You you build a good culture, and you get to know a bunch of good Kiwi boys. And I uh, enjoyed that. And so I think, yeah, I think that uh, it hasn't been professional rugby is – professional rugby for the most part you you enjoy some aspects more than others and, and some clubs do some things different and some do some better and uh, I think once you get in the routine of it though it's just about the people you're with and I've been pretty fortunate that way I've, I've made a lot of good friends and had a lot of good coaches that's awesome um do you get, speaking of professional rugby do you get a chance to watch any of the major league rugby back in U.S. and Canada yeah, I've watched a bit of it. Uh, that first year, especially, I watched a decent bit of the Seattle games. I had a lot of friends playing there. Uh, this year, I haven't actually – I didn't manage to catch a game this year, a full game. I always watch all the highlights. But, uh, yeah, I didn't sit down and watch a whole game. But, obviously, I, I know a few guys. Like I know Maunani has gone over there now. And uh, I was with Bastero for that three weeks of the Barbarians tour before he decided to – well, he'd already signed to go over. And same with um, the Beast was there for two weeks. Yeah, and he's ended up over in Washington. So talking to those guys a bit, uh, it's obviously it's growing. Like it sounds, it sounds positive to me. I mean, the, yeah, I don't know when you say that bringing the MLR, the champion MLR team to 
the top 20 club teams in the world. I'm not sure we'd go over so well, but maybe in five years or something, that would be a, a good option. Yeah, it's, it's a good starting point for sure. It's probably 10, 15 years past, like probably 20 years behind Super Rugby and everything else with growth, but, you know, it's got to start somewhere. So hopefully it's a good pickup and uh, hopefully yeah, it can yeah. take strong, I guess. All right, so this part here, this is a little bit different. So we're going to do some quick fire questions. I'll get about 10. And I'm just going to, I'm going to ask you a question and you got to think of an answer as quick as you can. All right. Let's do it. All right. Best team you ever faced? Crusaders. Best player you ever faced? Bowden Barrett. Chips or cookies? Cookies. What kind? Just uh, chocolate chip, standard. <laughs> Favorite beer? Oh, Waikato Draft. <laughs> What's your a guilty pleasure? Uh, I don't know. I just go hunting all over. <laughs> I was like a guilty one. I'm not sure. <laughs> what do you hunt? <laughs> Anything I can go for here. Red deer, sika deer, fellow deer, ducks, turkeys, pigs. Jeez. All right. Best place for a, a post-beer match or post-match beer, sorry. <laughs> Maybe the Roxy after we've had a good game in Vancouver. <laughs> Series that you're binge watching right now. Um the Tiger Hunter. Is it no Tiger King? Tiger King. <laughs> Fair enough. What's your favorite uh, and, and Hunters as well? I'm doing both. Hunters, the okay. Nazi hunting one. Okay. Favorite movie? Uh, Happy Gilmore or Shawshank Shaw Shaw. Redemption. Oh, two, two classics. Favorite sport to watch? Ice hockey. Who's your favorite team? Leafs. Adam, all right. I knew there was something about you. <laughs> Who had the biggest impact on you as a player? Kieran Crowley had the biggest impact, but without Dave Donald, my high school coach, I never would have played the game. So Awesome. All right, so got a few questions left. What are your thoughts? And the, these are just, you can, you know, a little bit longer, lengthy if you'd like. What are your thoughts on what makes a great team player? I think someone that can just buy into to what you're trying to do as a team. You don't, uh, yeah, you can't, be, you can't be selfish trying to do your own thing because rugby's not a sport where you can, you'll, you'll get, you get isolated and be on your own in, in every aspect of, of life. And uh, if, if you do that as a rugby player. So, yeah, just, just buying into the common goal, I think, common cause. Thanks. What are your beliefs on the merits of character over skill? Yeah, I would, I would pick a good character guy over, over the highest skilled guy every time because you can, you can work on the skills and the, and the physical side of rugby. That ties back in with what you just said about what makes a great team player too, right? Good. Exactly. Ah. Uh, this is something I've been thinking of. What are your thoughts on a potential Americas tour similar to the Lions tour, but it would involve Canada, U.S., Argentina, and Uruguay? Maybe taking eight, ten of the top players from each of those nations and doing tours to Europe every three or four years. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I never, I've never given it much thought. I mean, if you were to pick the best team, you probably would only have a, a couple of Northern North American players and you'd have a lot of Argentinians, but I think it would be yeah, pretty cool. I think it'd be kind of neat. All right, so lastly, any great rugby stories you can share with us? If you want to throw somebody under the bus, go right ahead. It's entirely up to you. <laughs> any great rugby stories? Let's, let's Jeff Sinclair threw Chauncey O'Toole under the bus a couple of times. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, they spent a lot of time together, those two. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> Got to think of something that won't get myself in trouble if I, <laughs> if I say <laughs> Uh, a great rugby story. I don't know. I think um, the thing I like about New Zealand so much is a lot of the stories I have with the rugby guys don't involve rugby, which is which is uh, which is really nice. Because, uh, I think one of the craziest. I, I wouldn't be like a funny story or um, or anything overly entertaining, but we went last year. We we had a rough start to our season. We ended up pulling things back, and we. Uh, we had to head over to um, Melbourne to play the to play the Rebels, and if we 
we, so if we won the game, we had a chance at coming eighth and sneaking into the last spot in the playoffs. If we lost the game, we were out. And if we won the game with a bonus point, then we were guaranteed to be in, but we could be seventh or eighth. So we went over there, and they'd been playing pretty well. And all they had to do was draw or win, and they were in the playoffs. So we ended up uh, we ended up putting, I can't even remember, I'd say like 50-odd points on them, got our bonus point. So we had, uh, yeah, we had a good time. We had a couple of drinks after that game in Melbourne and a uh, great city. But obviously knowing we had the quarterfinal the next week, so we flew back, got home. I think we got home at around, I'm trying to remember what time we got home. It would have been around 8, 8 or 9 p.m., I guess, from there. It was a normal flight coming back to when we got back to Hamilton. So we all went back to our houses, and they said, all right, set your alarms. I think it was for like 6 a.m. So we had to go to sleep at like midnight or whatever. You get to sleep, 6 a.m., wake up, and you got a message. And we had, like, I think it was like 7.30, 8 o'clock or something. We had to be on the bus everything packed on the bus and we had to get back to the Auckland airport and we had to fly over to Buenos Aires to play the Jaguares in the quarterfinal of that. Uh, oh. the, yeah. So having no idea where we were going and, and just packing our bags kind of endlessly. So we packed, we obviously lost that game, so we didn't get to keep going, but if we had a one, we would have gone straight from there to Canberra to play the Brumbies. And if we had a one that, then it was either straight to, we might've come home for a day or two and then gone to Christchurch, but it was either them or the Sharks or no, yeah, I think it was the Sharks that, that would have been in it by then. And uh, so, yeah, pretend we were packing our bags for three weeks anyways with just no idea where we were going from day to day. And we just kind of had to had to go with it. But um, the stories get a lot a lot better and uh, a lot less appropriate because we lost that game on a Friday <laughs> night in, uh, in Buenos Aires. And uh, we couldn't – the next flight home was until Monday morning. So, <laughs> <laughs> season's over. Yep. End, of, end of the year and uh, obviously – yeah, there was nothing, nothing left to, to go for after that. So we had a couple of good days in, in Buenos Aires, hanging out in Argentina there. And then uh, but the guy, uh, the rest of the squad was still left back in New Zealand. So we got off the flight and we had to just roll straight into a good few days back home to celebrate as a whole organization. So that was, <laughs> it ended up it just as a whirlwind of a, about two weeks there. Well, next time we chat, you're going to have to remember some of the stories from Buenos Aires when you were celebrating the end of the year. Yeah, they're all a bit blurry. I don't know if they're going to come back. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope until around 5 a.m. there. Yeah, that's, that's, not, that's a nice evening out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So, well, thank you very much for your time, Tyler. Really appreciate it. We'd love to have you on again sometime. Maybe we can do a, a round table with a couple of your old uh, teammates or something and, and just share and swap some stories that way. So it's been a pleasure. And uh, stay safe and uh, take care. Yeah, thank you very much. No problem. That's a huge thanks to Tyler for joining us today. That is uh, a great story, great conversation. Uh, and tell he just, he loves life. He loves rugby and he's really enjoying himself uh, big into hunting, which is really cool. Uh, he's enjoying his time down there in New Zealand, um, playing for the Chiefs. Great team. Waiting for the Super Rugby season to resume. What a great player and a definite class act. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, reconnect with some of your old rugby buddies, uh, you know, on social media, I'm watching some of my old teammates posting high school pictures and club rugby pictures. And it's, you know, bling, brings black, back a flood of memories for me. Uh, I haven't played in about 15 years, maybe a little longer. Um, but uh, it, it's really cool uh, reminiscing with some of those guys over social media. Uh, make sure you reconnect with your old buddies. Uh, I'd like to say thanks to Ben Sound Music for supplying us with their tunes. And as always, feel free to request topics for future podcasts. You know, drop some names, see if there's anybody you want to get on. Uh, but as always, this is Jamie. Until next time, stay safe and keep on rocking. <laughs>